Father, we thank you for this time. We bless your name because of these workers we treat. We thank you because of the things we've been exposing us to. And we pray that as we still continue with your word, you'll draw us closer to yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come before the pages of the scriptures now to consider the subject of this time, we're praying that you'll open our understanding. Amen. You will open the scriptures to us Amen. and help us, Lord, so that we will receive everything you are giving us. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lordship and leadership in the church. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. The concept of the church is something confusing in our day and in our age because the church has been erroneously identified with the building or with a system or with an organization or with just a group of people that gather together under a common religious interest but from the passage we have read, as well as from other passages of the Bible, you will see that the church is people. That is, people make up the church. Precious people in whom God is interested. Now when you understand that the church is people, and one, they are precious people in whom God is interested, if you have an opportunity or a privilege to be of service, of any use, to such people, to such church, you know, it's a great privilege. Number two, peculiar people that God treasures very much. Precious people, peculiar people that God treasures very much. Yes, they are people, but people that are peculiar that are different and that have a special place in the heart of our Father God in heaven. Three, they are princely people that God honors and holds in high esteem. Royal priesthood, the people that have the royal lineage, princely. Number four, they are peaceful, peace-loving people in whom God, on whom God can easily rule as a kingdom. They are not unruly. They are not incorrigible. They are not riotous. And they are not violent. Peaceful, peace-loving people. And God himself has made them so because he has cleansed them. He has forgiven their sins. Not only that, they are persecuted people. The world doesn't understand the true church, the real church. The world will support the adulterous church, the apostate church, the church that appears to be wild olive tree, unchanged, uncleansed, unregenerated. But the real church, you'll find they are persecuted people. The world doesn't understand them. And because they are persecuted people, God watches over them day and night. They are also purchased people whose price is so great that nothing else ever cost God so much to purchase. He had to give his only begotten son. And Jesus had to shed his own blood. Pay the great price so that these people could be purchased and become a very precious 
inheritance or heritage to the Lord. Not only that, they are purged people. And God is all the time perfecting them and preparing them for the holy place called heaven so that we can live eternally with him. Precious people, peculiar people, princely people, peace-loving and peaceful, or chaste and purged. And the Lord is always working in them and on them to perfect them and prepare them to live eternally with him. Now, as you realize this, your work in the church becomes well-defined. When we say we have a pastor on the church, that means it's a pastor over people that have relationship with God. Basically, scripturally, a pastor is not a pastor over the sinners that attend the church. That's shocking to the modern day. Because people feel that if they attend that church, born again or not born again, obedient to the word or not obedient to the word, if they just attend and they carry an identity card, a paper in their hand that contains their name and the name of the church, whether they are born again or not, they feel that the pastor has responsibility over them to offer not evangelistic message but pastoral care over them. But you don't find that in the New Testament. There were many people in Jerusalem, but Jesus was never a shepherd over them, only wanting to be their savior. There were many people in Capernaum, but none of the apostles had pastoral oversight over them, only the people that have been touched and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And in the New Testament, in the Acts of the Apostles, there were many people in the major cities of the land, in Ephesus, in Corinth, in uh, the province of Galatia, in Judea, in Samaria, all over the places. But those leaders in the church did not have a shepherding, pastoral care over everybody in the town. You couldn't come and wake up Peter or Paul at the dead of the night because Herod or Pilate or Caiaphas or somebody's wife, a drunkard's wife, was sick, and it says, call the elders of the church, that they will come anytime. Uh -uh. They were not their pastors. If they went at all, it will be on evangelistic purpose. We evangelize the world, we edify the church. And so, the pastor must first of all determine his own role, his own function, and you cannot determine your role and your function until you know what the church is and what the church is all about. But today, we're considering the lordship in the church and the leadership in the church. We need to combine both because if you try to lead the church without recognizing the authority of the lordship in the church, you'll go astray. And if you try to obey the leadership in the church, and you relegate the Lord in the church to the background. Again, you'll be having an idol you worship. That's why you need to consider the Lordship and the leadership together. The church has only one Lord. The whole church, worldwide, has only one Lord. And he himself said in John chapter 10, John chapter 10, verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Jesus Christ himself is the head of the church. The Lord in the church. And we read in Ephesians chapter 4. From verse 4. There is one body and one spirit. 
even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. These passages convince us and instruct us that there is only one individual to accept as the Lord in the church and over the church, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. But to us, there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all are all things, and we by him. Again, the passage mentions one Lord, and we know that that refers to Jesus Christ because it says very clearly, one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. When we mention the word Lord, what do we actually mean? Because there are circles where you have Jesus is Lord, as the placard that is carried about. Write it on paper, write it on poster, write it on stencil, they write it on stickers, they write it, they write it on, on their shirts, they write it on signboards, everywhere. Jesus is Lord. But in what sense is he Lord? To the people that are living in sin. And you cannot have two masters. Either you will receive the one and reject the other. You will either stay with the one or abandon the other. And Jesus himself said that he that commits sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abides in the house. Well then, all the people that are going about saying Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. They greet one another and they say Jesus is Lord. They come to their fellowship meeting, they say, Jesus is Lord. They sing with hands raised up and they say, Jesus is Lord. But what does that mean? In what sense is he Lord? Now, when we use the word Lord, the scriptures make it very clear. What is meant? In Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? That's the question that Jesus will have to ask the people that go about saying Jesus is Lord. And they come before the altar. They remember somebody has something against them. They'll never apologize. They'll never make restitution. That is not in their tenets of faith. And Jesus is saying, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? The supper having ended, he rose up and took a bowl of water and put a towel around him and he washed their feet. And he said, see ye what I've done for you? You call me Lord and Master, and so have you rightly said. But if I, your Lord and your Master, if I've done this unto you, don't do it to one another. Well, they didn't do it physically in the Acts of the Apostles. He was telling them on humility. How then will believers be going about, believers, members of the body of Christ, the church of God? And they are proud. They are not submissive. They cannot wash one another's feet and yet call him Lord, Lord. How Jesus must be asking them, why call ye me Lord, Lord? And do not the things which I say. Be therefore perfect, he said, as your heavenly Father in heaven is perfect. 
The majority in the church don't even believe in sanctification, in holiness. They don't accept the word of Jesus Christ. Swear not, he said. If they slap you on the one cheek, turn the other one. And he said, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, I endureth them. He'll be like the wise man that builds his house upon the rock. The storm, the waves, the wind will blow. But that house will stand. But the majority of church members today, they'll take one another to court. They will not turn the other cheek. You cannot cheat them. You cannot trample upon them. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Think about marriage. And think about the many people in the church world that are divorced and remarried. And yet he said, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Why are all these people just going about singing and testifying, Jesus is Lord, and they never obey his word. They don't even want to hear preachers talk about the commandments. All they want, the promises. Have you any word of encouragement for me? No, a word of warning. Have you a promise for me in the Bible today? What did the Lord tell you to tell me today? Well, he told me to tell you the axe is laid on the root of the tree. And every tree that bears not fruit will be cut down, thrown into the fire. No, that's not the word of the Lord. They won't accept that. All they want is that smile, he loves you. Whoever you are, whatever you are doing, you are the righteousness of God. He's going to prepare a place for us. The place is clean and it doesn't matter whether we're dirty or defiled. We're going there. That's the deceit they want to hear. And Jesus is saying, you call me Lord, Lord, you neglect my word. You neglect my commandments. You neglect my revelation. What does it mean to say Lord? Number one, it means the controller who manifests total and complete control over the church. That's the Lord. When we call him Lord, we call him by his name. And the name has meaning. And it means he is the controller who manifests total, complete control over the church. If Jesus is Lord, it's not a board of elders that has the final authority over the doctrines and the teaching of the church. How many times do we sometimes come together and uh, there are people that say, well, that message of the pastor as the board sanctioned it, which board? To sanction repentance from sin. Which board? To sanction restitution of all the wrong things you have done. Which board? To sanctify holiness, uh, to, sancti uh, to sanction holiness, sanctification experience. And then uh, we say, now this program the church is going to have, evangelism outreach, as the board approved it, I don't know. If they are backsliders, they'll never approve it. If they are covetous, they don't want the church money to go on printing of tracts, on having crusade, they'll never sanction it, they'll never approve it. All they will approve will be social function. Eat and drink, for tomorrow the board will die. But if they are born again, they don't have to sanction it. It's sanctioned from heaven already. Evangelism program. Now, this decision of the church that we're not going to marry this person that is already pregnant before the wedding, as the board looked into the case, they don't need to look into the case. Already the Bible has looked into the case. And um, if your interest is different from the interest of the Bible, and you're going about saying that we are members of the board, and that woman that is pregnant, well, we just have to wear that person. That person is too important to neglect like that. It means you are backsliding. You are not even part of the church. I wonder who puts you in the board. And you and the board and the black board <laughs> will all go into hellfire eventually. No board sanctions doctrines of the Bible. It's sanctioned and sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ. And already there's no discussion on those doctrines. They are already sealed, settled and sanctioned. And so people do not understand what is the place of Christ in the church. And they want to know who has the total control on the church is the Lord himself. 
Now, number two, what does it mean to be Lord? It means the master whose word is final and ends all dispute and argument. Have you ever noticed whenever Jesus Christ came to his disciples and they were discussing something concerning the church or concerning their lives, whatever they were arguing about, whatever they were discussing, the word of the master ended and finalized all dispute and argument. We will not be having so many conferences today determining where the church ought to stand, what the church ought to preach, if we really accepted and received Jesus Christ as Lord, because we would have taken his word and he has spoken about everything in the scriptures. Then to be Lord means, number three, the captain whose instructions and commands are preferred above life. Is the captain before the army. And in all the problems and persecutions in the church, the captain is going before us. Now even in the army of the world, whenever the one leading the army, whenever he gives a word, his word is preferred above your very life. That means even if that commandment will lead to death, his word is preferred above life. And Jesus Christ is Lord. That means he's captain. Now you go to many people that are wearing the badge, saying Jesus is Lord. And uh, you tell them that you've done this before. You have to make restitution. Oh, they will tell you, if I do that, I will get into prison. Then go ahead and get to the prison. Because if you say he is Lord... You will prefer his word above your freedom. You will prefer his word above your very life. If you obey the Lord and you die obeying the Lord, you are just carrying out the very meaning of the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's nothing strange in it. Captains in army, they have directed soldiers to go on in the battle and not to retreat, not to go back. Many of them have lost their lives for it. Mothers, don't accuse the president in the country. Parents or relatives will not come around uh, the compound or wherever the president is living and uh, say, my child died. In fact, they count it as high honor that you died on service. But then Jesus Christ is Lord in the church and he commands us to go and evangelize in a particular place. Oh, we say there are so many mosquitoes there, I may die of malaria. It's better to die of malaria obeying the Lord. That's better than reject his lordship and say, because that place is dangerous, I cannot go. His words are greater than your very life. Or you are supposed to go and preach the gospel in a particular place. The Lord says so. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Oh, the last preacher that went there, they imprisoned him. So if I go, they may imprison me. Go ahead and get imprisoned. Because he is Lord. And that means you prefer him above your life, above education, above family, above prosperity, above anything and everything. If your mind is not like that, he is not Lord. If the church is not like that, he is not Lord. And I'll rather just stop deceiving myself, deceiving the Lord, and deceiving community, thinking that I am saved, I am consecrated, I am yielded to the Lord, and yet I will not accept the Lordship of the Lord. Have you ever seen how wives will talk to their husbands? Now my husband, remember we are now married. Before we were married, you could go anywhere and do anything. Now please, if you die, remember that here I am and look at our children. And we will begin to cry. Limit your consecration to my tears. Be very careful. Don't go beyond what I would approve. You are usurping the place of Jesus Christ. You will not be in the kingdom. You are taking the glory that belongs to him. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ talking to this man. He owns him by creation. He owns him by regeneration. He owns him by the call and the vision he has given to him. And yours is the secondary place. But here you are crying and crying and telling your husband, are you still praying on that thing? Are you still going to just 
go to the villages and go to all the local government areas and preach every time. Ah, we finished uh, Bible study at 8 o'clock. And uh, 10 o'clock, I was still expecting you. And I'm feeling so lonely. Go ahead and feel lonely. <laughs> because that man is going to serve the Lord. It's a serious, serious issue. And there are wives that will not allow their husbands to serve the Lord. They say you are doing too much. And you are ashamed of yourself. Telling your husband he is doing too much for Christ who died on the cross of Calvary. You want Jesus to do less for you? To withdraw his blood. His blood is too much for you then. His grace is too much for you. His sacrifice is too much for you. His agony is too much for you. You don't deserve it. You don't merit it. And you are telling your husband, giving one hour extra in counseling. Giving two hours extra in counseling. That is too much. Too much for the Lord. Or sometimes your husband has to be called away to another place. Maybe outside the country. And you feel so lonely. Why? Suppose your husband is involved in the army of this world. And he goes into the forest, into the bush. Eating on diets that almost has no taste. Just to maintain him. And he's fighting on. And you're re reading in the papers, people are dying. And whether your husband has died or not, you don't know. He's lost the leg or not, you don't know. Maybe eventually he comes back. And he's not dead, but two fingers are gone. One leg is gone, amputated. One ear is blown off, and he comes back. <laughs> and he's still yours, man. And then they give him medals at Tinumbu Square. <laughs> but the medals will never replace the leg. But you are happy. But if we send your husband on missionary work, and he loses a single finger. Oh, look at what church has done against me. And you are ashamed of yourself. That Jesus is Lord means he is the captain. Whose instructions and commands are preferred above life. He is Lord. What does that mean? It means, number four, he is the ruler whose letter or messenger is regarded with the same honor. As accorded to him. You know, many people do not realize that today. Here we have our state representatives, and there are people in the church that never think of honoring them, respecting them. In fact, um, you'll find them saying, After all, is that not brother so and so? Oh, yes, that's brother so and so. I know all his history. That's all right. I know much of the history of Jesus Christ also, but. That doesn't lessen my respect for him. I think I know all the shortcomings and all the problems that Peter caused among the disciples, but I'll never equate myself with him. He's still above. I think I know some steps that Paul took from the study of the scriptures that I'll feel, why did he take that step? But I think I respect him as a teacher and the apostle sent to the Gentiles. I know all the history of the state representative. That's all right. But for you to say that you know Jesus Christ as Lord means that he is a ruler whose letter or messenger is regarded with the same honor as he would have accorded unto Jesus Christ. That's what he himself said. He that receives you receives me. He that receives me receives him that sent me. He that rejects you, my representatives and messengers, have rejected me as well and him that sent me and so many people do not realize when they say jesus christ is lord what it actually means and if you know the meaning of the fact that jesus christ is lord you will respect and honor your pastor more than you have done the state leader more than you have done the local government area leader more than you have done now it means also number five that is king to whom we pay complete loyalty. I didn't say to whom we give complete loyalty, to whom we pay. It's a debt we owe that must be paid. A king to whom we pay complete loyalty. And we pay with unquestioning obedience. That's when we say Jesus is Lord. 
He is Lord, then he is king. And he demands and deserves our loyalty and unquestioning obedience. Number one, he is controller. Number two, he is master. Number three, he is captain. Number four, he is ruler. Number five, he is king. Number six, he is the one and only one with all authority over all we are, all we have, and all we own. And there is no possession too great which cannot be surrendered unto him. That means he is Lord in reality. He is the one and only one. With all authority over all that we are, have, or own. And there is no possession too great or too dear or too precious that we cannot surrender unto him. The Lord is, Jesus is Lord over his church. And it is the Father God in heaven that has given him this highly exalted position. In Philippians chapter 2, from verse 9, Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of all things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, from verse 28, And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. 29, And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethphage, and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a cold tide, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do ye lose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord has need of him. And that will settle the whole matter. These people, having this cult that they never used, that never profited from the fact that they owned it. And yet the Lord said to his own disciples, Go and bring it, I need it. If any man will ask you, Why are you taking away that cult? one answer will be sufficient because the Lord has need of him. That is to be our attitude if we say that Jesus is Lord. You have a husband, the Lord has need of him. And without tears, without complaint, without murmuring, without secretly complaining to other people, how you feel now that your husband is not there, without even feeling what great things you think, you think you are sacrificing, you just accept the fact the Lord has need of him. Is it your wife that is also needed? Because as it is on the side of the women having to surrender their husbands to the Lord, so it is on the side, on the side of the man having, having to surrender their wives to the Lord. Here we are that we have finished a fellowship. And there is a sorrowful woman that needs the attention of your wife. You are a preacher. You've been busy since morning yourself, counseling, going up and down, writing or reading or praying. As you own fasting. 
And at the end of the day, you have given yourself to service and you have preached. You are exhausted and tired and worn out. But your wife is also a leader in the fellowship. And as much as she knows her responsibility to the home, she also recognizes her need and the need of people in the church. And somebody came to her with an urgent emergency case and said, now, my sister, this is my problem. This is my trouble. Help me out. And she spent some time helping that sister out. Before finishing, another person came along and said, now, sister, um, I mean, I want an opportunity to just meet with you. I, I need this. I need that. And already you are back home. You have not eaten since morning. You are exhausted. You are tired. You are hungry. You are thirsty. Everything is just on you. And you say, ah, why are so and so not come? Eventually she comes back. And uh, you say, what have you been doing? You didn't know that I was waiting on the Lord today. I'm so hungry. And you are not hungry, but you're only terribly hungry. <laughs> and uh, she said that, uh, well, somebody needed my attention. I needed to counsel and pray with her. Pray with her when I'm dying of hunger here. How about the preaching that she had um, just at the service and that one is not enough. You sat at another service after I finished. The Lord has need of her, brother. Understand that you are also to give her a chance when the Lord wants to make use of her. That, that is part of your acceptance that Jesus is Lord. How about your money? The husband is receiving a big salary. Perhaps 600 naira a month. And uh, the wife has calculated the tithe ought to be just 60 naira. But then there is something going on in the church. And on Sunday, the man dropped 300 naira in the offering. And then we came back home. Now, you didn't even discuss last night about the salary and, you know, the things that you've got. Because I've been thinking I need to buy a new cooker. I need to buy this and that. I, need, I want this house to be very, very neat, and I'm really planning on some things, and um, I really want to serve you better. How about the money now? Well, <laughs> but you had the plea and the motivation that the pastor gave the other time, and if we don't do something, who else will do it? I gave out half of the whole salary. What? <laughs> Isn't it just the tithes that God has entitlement to? Why give him more than the 300, not even 100? The Lord has need of it. That's the fact that you are accepting that Jesus is Lord. Have you listened to sisters and brothers that said, Ah, good old days. When deeper life used to give everything for the, for the printing of tracts. And we will not eat. And we'll just be living on meager amount. Those are the backsliders. Good old days. They never do it again. They never give again. They grudge God. Good old days. Have you remembered good old days when we just spent all our money on evangelism, on retreat, on this and on that? Thank God now that things are changing in our church. That right now, you know, we just eat and we look good and we dress well and, you know, things are better. And now we can spend our money educating our children. Those are the backsliders. They don't accept Jesus as Lord anymore. He's not Lord over their possession. He's not Lord over what they have. No wonder that all your churches that have visited, those churches are collapsing. If it were not the fact that Jesus has promised to be with you where two or three are gathered together, he would not have been there. The mosques in your, in your cities are better than the churches you are in. And the people that are wearing white garments, that are drinking holy water, they have better churches than you people have. But thank God in Lagos here, we tell them, let them receive Jesus as Lord. He has right to all their possession. And we don't have to beg the people here. If they belong to God, their money belongs to God. Not tithe, not tithe. That's the beginning. That's where you start. When you're a new convert. And if all that you're still giving is a tithe after 20 years of conversion, 10 years of conversion, you are not growing. You are stingy over your possession and the pastor has to cry and weep and some of our pastors have to go on a sideline job go and do this job and this job before money can come into the church to build the church 
but in the early church those people that accepted jesus as lord they sold their lands they sold their houses where are we going to live i don't know where you're going to live the church has priority are you saying that we should give all our money if the lord has need of it give all of it are we preachers now talking about money we're not talking about money alone we're talking about your possession and your house and your car and your land and your very life you think we're preaching money we're preaching more than money we're preaching the total surrender of all that comes into your hand that's lordship and that is christianity that is the face of the new testament but the one that we go around the corner because they passed um, they passed paper right pledge and you write pledge of 20 naira state representatives throw their papers back to them if that's if that is all the respect and all the commitment they have for the lord throw it to them and then go and pray and let manna come down from heaven we build their church without them and then they, they can become bench warmers and come and be sitting in church but jesus is not lord over such people that will only give every, you know, in the offering, 50 kobo. Zona leader. Receiving 500 naira. Teaching other people. Having zones under him. Giving 50 kobo for offering. Shame on you. I'll never give it. If I won't give anything at all, I'll never give 50 kobo. One naira. If I have anything, why am I alive? Oh my Lord. If I could be a millionaire, I'll build all your churches for you. And I'll build the best building in town for the Lord Jesus Christ. If I could sell myself for money, I'll do it. And I'll build churches, I'll give tracts, I'll give my life. If I could do anything, if I had a house, if I had a car, anything I have, I'll give everything. You people living in ramshackle buildings in your stage, they make, uh, you know, that building, it has no floor, it has no window, and it has no ceiling, and it has no fan, ordinary fan. And even when you have a fan, it's blowing the dust on the faces of the people that are worshipping. Shame on you. Rise up and commit yourself to the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee very much. There's no like unto thee. We bless you for the message of this morning. And we thank thee because Christ himself, when he came to this world, all that he had, he has given to the salvation of men. We bless you because your power is still available. And your grace is still available. Father, we are praying today. As many as are here who have heard this message, you will touch all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter came in service generation. Paul came, no property, no car, nothing to give, and he went to heaven. Everlasting Father, as many as are here today, our property, our time, our life. May we give to you totally in Jesus' name. Amen. If children will not sing, God said He can raise up stones against them. Father, in this our Deepala Bible Church, all over the states, all over locations, as many as are here today, the power of God to deny ourselves totally and to give all our lives unto you. Get all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Many workers today serving the Lord with only one hour, serving the world with all their life, serving the world with all their money, planning for building, planning for property, never planning for the kingdom of God. Everlasting Father, all this selfishness in the church, all this carnality in the church, Father, take it away in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, if you are going to heaven, to miss something in heaven, it is in this world we must save for it. Paying the money, putting the treasure for heaven. Father, we are praying all the things that we lay in the world. 
and we are expecting as if Jesus will never come. We are praying that we become dung and draw to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our life must change because we can no longer continue like this. Our church is around circles and we are living in big, big buildings. Everlasting Father, from today, the grace to change totally for you and to consecrate and to give all to you. Give to all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Many today, they can go to politics, they can discuss politics, but to need that and pray, to go about preaching the word of God, to give their money to the cross of Christ, we don't do anymore. And here we are in the National Workers Retreat, calling ourselves deeper life Bible church workers. Father, we pray that carnality, that sensuality in everybody we see.